So hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in today. This month, the month of May is Foster Care Awareness Month and is a time to recognize that we can each play a part in enhancing the lives of children and youth in foster care. My name is Kimberly Levitt and I'm the Health Programs and Supportive Services Manager at Bradbury Sullivan LGBT Community Center in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I will be moderating our discussion today. I am very excited to be joined by two lovely people. We are joined by Dorota Gashinisha Kozak, who is the chair of the Adoption and Assisted Reproductive Technology Law Practice Group for King Spry Law Firm in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Dorota has built her legal practice in family and estate law, helping to form, guide, and protect families through some of the biggest moments of their lives. King Spry was honored um, with the Bradbury Sullivan Community Leadership Award in 2019. We're also joined by Jeb, Deb Schoner, the Director of Community Programs for the Children's Home of Reading Youth and Family Services. She has ser served on numerous local, regional, and state committees regarding permanency and other child welfare issues for over 25 years, and is considered an expert in the field of adoption and foster care throughout the state of Pennsylvania. So thank you so much for both of you to join this event today. We're very excited to have you. So I'm gonna thank start- Thank you for having us. Yeah. So I'm gonna start off just with some general questions and, and we can kind of get the conversation going. Um, so of course, we all know we are about a year out of COVID-19. Um, so a lot in the world has changed. I know that the courts were closed for a while. A lot of things were put on hold because of that. So if one or both of you could touch on what it really looks like now in the court system and can we still adopt during the COVID-19 pan COVID pandemic? If okay by you, Deb, I'll start. Yep. So you are correct, Kimberly, when, when this all kind of hit, um, and COVID um, was just an unknown, uh, the courts closed down. And unfortunately, um, with respect to our adoptions, uh, there was a hold on our adoptions. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it's a county-based system with respect to how our adoptions are handled through the court system. So each county handled um, the, you know, the COVID restrictions in their own way and then reopened um, in due time, you know, after we were able to learn more about what those requirements um, brought and how we could handle um, being back in court. Mostly um, virtual courtroom hearings um, occurred at that point. And in a lot of respects that has continued, some courthouses and counties have opened um, and have restrictions and protections within the courtroom. Uh, but mostly uh, hearings are still occurring in the virtual setting. So although we might have been delayed somewhat initially, um, depending on the county, and many counties um, did some catch up by adding additional days for hearings, mm -hmm. additional um, hearing you know, options uh, because of those delays, uh, we're mostly caught up at this point um, due to being able to do them virtually as well as in person but it really depends county by county, but we are busier than ever with respect to adoptions. So yes, adoptions are happening. We're excited that they're continuing and it's one of my busiest years uh, in adoptions, which is an exciting, uh, exciting time for us here at King Spry. That's great. Do you think that it's more, you're, you're having a busier time now because of, of that uh, brief like pause during the beginning of COVID? It's not busier because of the, because of the brief um, pause. It's busier because more people are adopting. Okay. That's great. That's great to hear. Thank you. Deb, do you have And any I would say we had the same experience. Um, we saw a delay in the, you know, late spring till courts kind of figured out how they were going to manage and handle things. But we too had uh, over a number of adoptions last year, more than we've seen in quite some time. Um, I think one thing that may be impacting now currently with COVID-19 through the uh, child welfare system though, is that I think courts and counties are trying to figure out um, 
how they work with birth families in terms of their abilities to access services. And so because there's been some limitations and delays for families to be able to access services, it is also delaying counties decision points on whether children can return home safely or if they're going to move to terminate parental rights and move kids towards adoption. So I think that's still an area that we will see uh, some changes in over the next year. But I know that there are counties who ha have not wanted to terminate parental rights because of the delays in services that families have had. So, and it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, no, that's great to hear everything is, um, you know, technology is a wonderful thing. So being able to have a virtual court system is, uh, is wonderful in this case. Um, so I think it's important for listeners to get a little bit of just a background information on the difference between an open and closed adoption, and what are the legal differences between those two things? Uh, thanks, Kimberly. I could start with, with that. Um, I'm, I'm so excited to, to be talking about this, you know, these types of differences, because, you know, there's been a shift in my world with respect to um, closed or, or open adoptions. Um, a lot of what we do now is centered around open adoptions because of the world that we live in. Uh, it's really hard to be anonymous today um, with DNA testing and options to locate um, your birth parents. It's, it, there is definitely a shift towards more openness in adoptions and our adoption statutes have actually mirrored that as well with some amendments that have occurred in the last few years um, gauging everything towards a more open environment in adoptions. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like, a closed adoption is more of a, like a confidential adoption. It's very limited. It doesn't identify um, the birth parents or any parties involved, you know, prospective um, and adoptive parents. Uh, you don't meet each other or you choose not to meet each other and there's not continuing contact in most instances. Um, with an open adoption, you know, there's a lot of concerns that families have with respect to open adoptions, with, which could be considered in a lot of ways um, researched areas that um, now indicate that a lot of the concerns that um, adoptive parents might have had initially with respect to open adoptions is not necessarily the case. And children in those instances have more access to information because in an open adoption, in, um, what Pennsylvania allows is um, an agreement between the parties in writing that's called a post-adoption contact agreement um, that's actually reviewed and approved by the court. And it almost acts like a custody order. Um, so if you've ever been involved in any kind of family law or custody dispute, it kind of operates in that same fashion. It's enforceable through the court system. Um, and it could be as simple as meeting and then exchanging photographs, information, things of that nature to um, a more uh, regular contact with the child and their, you know, the birth parents, um, photos, graduations, and other points of contact that are all spelled out in the agreement and enforceable if one party is not operating under that agreement. So that's the difference between the, the, the types of adoption. So closed, you know, very limited in terms of information. Um, and you would have to register with the state, which is a possibility today to obtain additional information through the state, but your birth parent would also have to sign up um, and provide that information and possibly have um, a, an introduction and meeting where the open adoption is, you know, the terms are set forth, that's in the best interest of the child, that spell out exactly what that contact will look like in the future, and everyone works within those parameters. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. That's really helpful. Um, Deb, do you have anything else that you wanted to add or any personal experiences that you've had with either open or closed adoption with clients? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen over time and the research shows that, um, you know, there are m many people who are in their 60s and 70s. And when they talk about having been adopted and not knowing their family and how 
that's really impacted their life over, you know, uh, their lifespan. You know, I mean, these are people that are 60 and 70 years old. And so we've learned a lot of lessons about how we did things a long time ago. And, and, and that this is one of those areas that being open with children that they were adopted is, it, you know, is something that's very important. So we're talking about open and closed adoption in terms of a court hearing, but just the whole openness with, saying to kids, you know, even if you adopt as an infant, like you were an adopted child, you know, you came to us, this is what your story was. This is what we know about your birth family, regardless of if they have contact or not. And these post-adoption contact agreements um, that Dorada was talking about also are, uh, can be an effect for siblings. So when we have siblings who may be being adopted in different families, um, they can have post-adoption contact agreements to ensure that they're gonna continue to have access um, and contact with each other, which is really so important because we know that the longest relationship anybody is ever gonna have is with their siblings. Um, so you know we try to support that as best we can. So that's another way that the uh, PAC agreements um, can be helpful, helpful for kids uh, as they're adopted. And that's a good point, Deb, because you know there's other family members that can be involved in these post-adoption -adopt contact agreements. So that, that's a great point. You know, there's others that are involved in that contact, which is really important. What I've heard from our adoptees and their families um, is that over time, they lose the sense of you know, who they, who they are, where they came from. And there's a lot of questions that come with that along the way. This eliminates all of that. You know, there's, there's that secrecy is eliminated and there's a deeper understanding of the adoptee in the future, which is really the, the reason why the openness is such an important part of the process because of that ability to have information in the future. From the brief research that I was doing, I noticed that a closed um, adoption is actually not very common anymore. Do you believe that's the case? And do you, do, what are the reasons why you think that is? At least in the United States, excuse me. In the United States, closed adoptions are not as common. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer first. Uh, they're not common in, in our practice any longer. And like I said, it's because, you know, it's really hard to be anonymous today. Um, it, it, it's almost an impossibility in, in today's time. So you know, for the most part, openness, like we said, is, is such a positive part of the adoption process for the adoptee and, and the family in the future with respect to information, cultural information, medical information, social information, I mean, all of that is, you know, is, is accessible to the adoptee, but also um, there's that point of contact, you know, there, there's the ability to, to have questions answered with respect to why they're even, why were they even adopted? Um, you know, there's all of those questions that come about that are, that make it such a positive influence on the adoption process. Um, but like I said, it's just really hard to have a closed adoption today, realistically. Yeah, I think, again, it goes to research and what we've learned. And, um, you know, it, it is better for the adoptees to have knowledge of their background and even continuing knowledge of those people who were part of their life before being adopted. And, and what part could they maybe play in their life going forward? You know, the, there's a lot of positives that come out of that. Um, you know, we it takes a village to raise a child. And, and it's not just, you know, you sever one village to get to another village. And so whatever we can do to be inclusive with that is really what we need to be doing. Thank you so much. Um, so th the next few things I wanted to go over were really just m busting some myths that are always buzzing around about who can serve as a foster parent or a foster family. Um, some of the top questions that I saw were I'm too or comments rather were I'm too old to be a foster parent or I'm not married so I can't be a foster parent or I don't own a home so I'm not eligible. Can uh, one or both of you touch on the eligibility criteria and anything people would need to know approaching uh, thinking about being a foster parent or a foster family? 
Um, I, I'll go ahead and start with that one. We really have a minimum age to be a foster parent in Pennsylvania and it's 21. Um, and some counties have even asked for a waiver from the state if it made sense that somebody be a foster parent younger than 21. Um, so, you know, even though there is some minimum restrictions, uh, that doesn't mean that it might not be a possibility. And it's certainly something that if, you know, someone's interested in, they should always pursue and ask their questions. That's what we always say, you know, give us a call and let's talk about what, what you're thinking. Um, but owning your own home, you know, we just wanna make sure that you can provide for yourself and your family before adding a child to your home. Um, so you don't have to own your own home. You don't have to own a car. Um, you just have to be able to, you know, provide. Um, one of the key things we also look for is what is your support network? What does that look like? Um, so it does not matter if you're a single foster parent, you're a married couple, um, you're LGBTQ, it does not matter. We, we're going to ask you the same questions. You know, who is your support network? Um, have you ha any experience with kids? Um, I think that with um, LGBTQ couples or, or people, they often don't have some of those experiences. They may not have had their own children, um, but do you have a willingness to learn? Do you have a willingness to seek help and have a support network that's going to help you with parenting? Um, so lots of myths, and we really just encourage people to call and, and and let us know. I, I often use this story of one of our foster parents who I just distinctly remember. And she started out by saying, you know, I thought I would call, I saw your ad, but I'm pretty sure you don't want us as parents. And she, her conversation was around having a daughter who had experienced some issues with drugs and alcohol. And they had helped her through that experience, but they felt that that was going to disqualify them that there was somehow some sort of dysfunction in their family that was going to cause them to not be approved. And I said, you, you probably make one of our best foster parents because you understand some of the systems that we work with. Um, you've been able to help a child overcome a challenge, which is what we're looking for. Um, so there's lots of uh, flexibility in terms of, of who can be a foster parent with some state requirements, um, like a minimum age of being 21. But um, you have to pass clearances. And yes, there's lots of training and there's um, clearances and background checks and a lot of intrusive questions we're gonna ask because we need to ensure that families are safe and can provide um, well-being and permanency uh, for children. And I'll just add, let's be clear. In Pennsylvania, any adult can adopt. And like Deb said, you know, we have a lot of um, requirements in place to ensure safety and security, but any adult can adopt. You can be single, you know, your employment is, um, is reviewed, you go through your clearances, there's home studies in, in most instances, but not with step parent or second parent adoptions. And most counties don't even require that, but the, it does require some um, information with respect to your household. So it's not restrictive. What's restrictive is to ensure that there, like Deb said, that there's safety and security provided to the child. But in most instances, there's nothing that is um, restricting the LGBTQ community from adopting in any way, not based on the statutes in Pennsylvania. No, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people will be excited to hear that, um, that there, it's, it's not necessarily a restrictive system. It's um, a system built to really help these children. Um, so one of the next questions that I was really just curious about was what is it, so once someone is interested, they realize that they're eligible and they're looking to work with a different, um, you know, different types of agencies, whether they're religiously affiliated or operate among multiple states or they're in, independently run or locally run, what questions should people be asking these different agencies when they're looking to be a foster parent or a foster family? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, we we're governed by the same rules, laws here in Pennsylvania. So what we do at our agency and what somebody else does at their other agencies, like we have, we are governed by that. But then as individual agencies, we may have different policies and procedures that we follow. And that's where I think you start to get into um, some organizations that go across states tend to have some corporate kinds of policies that may not 
be the best thing for Pennsylvania or may not be the best thing for the county in Pennsylvania within you where you live. Um, you know, we all live in this 67 county run state, you know, which I often talk about. And so what's good for Pittsburgh isn't necessarily what's good for Luzerne County or what's good for, you know, Adams County. And, and so it's important that within your own area, you know, that you find uh, an organization or an agency that's going to support you and provide you with what you need as a family and where you feel comfortable. All of us as agencies are going to ask intrusive questions to get to the place where we know that kids will be safe. Um, but you've got to look for what you're comfortable with. Some religious organizations um, are inclusive for LGBTQ. Some are not. Um, but if that's a, where you feel you're comfortable, then you know you may want to seek out those organizations that are inclusive, that are religiously based. Um, and then again, you know, you know, for us, we happen to be a standalone, you know, nonprofit, able to look at what's happening within our own area to make changes as we need to um, within best practice. Um, an example you know, I can give you is 20 years ago, we saw an increasing population within the Berks County area um, of a Hispanic population and more and more kids were coming into care. I mean, we pursued um, looking to find Spanish speaking families and bilingual families because we wanted to ensure that we were meeting the needs of the kids the best we could. So if we were you know, a, a larger corporation, we may not have been able to do that, but we could do that 20 years ago because you know, we looked at the need, what's happening in our backyard. And we consider our backyard, not just Berks County, but Berks County, surrounding counties, you know, regionally. And we service a number of counties when it comes to foster care and adoption. And just so I can add, you know, yeah. we, we deal with so many different types of agencies, also religious-based agencies. Um, it's our policy here to only work with agencies that are all inclusive, okay? So, so I, I wanted to make that clear because even the religious agencies that we have used are also inclusive, mm -hmm. uh, so no restrictions. But at the same time, my advice would always be research, research, research. What I mean by that is that there's lots of information out there that can give you a good guide as to what is a best fit for you. You know, every, you know, like Deb said, every agency operates in a different fashion. We all collect the same information um, and we're, we're all looking for families. Um, so it, these agencies want families. Um, and it's so important that you research that it's a good fit for your particular family. Um, what I mean by that is research the information that's there online, but also ask around with other families that have used agencies. Word of mouth is ideal in these situations because you want to make sure that you're using an agency that's experienced in your area um, and also with the type of family that you want to have. Um, the more open that you are with respect to the family that um, or the adopted child that you wish to have in your home, the better also. I know that my families that are very restrictive with respect to their adoptions, they wait longer. Um, but that is one of the questions that you should ask. How many LGBT adoptions do you do? Are you experienced in this area? How long do these families have to wait? Um, and then ask, ask your friends that have done it. I know that a, a majority of my referrals are from word of mouth. You know, you do this and you're able to be, have that experience to provide uh, the best quality service to your clients. So that's the best way to, to kind of gauge who's out there, you know, and what's the best fit in your situation. Yeah, and you bring up a good point about the criteria uh, in terms of like age of child or, uh, you know, might be challenges that some of the kids may come with that uh, a, a person or a couple is comfortable with or willing to learn. So to me, it doesn't matter if you're a same sex couple or a different sex couple. If you come to me and say you only want an infant under the age of six months, my answer to you is going to be the same. You're going to wait because we don't have many of those placements that come through the foster care system. You know, again, same sex couple or different, you know, sex couple, if you come and say, I'm open to learn new things, I'm open to a range of age, I'm open to, you know, those, that's where we're able to find placements for you much easier by having that openness and that flexibility. Absolutely, absolutely. 
Thank you for sharing that. That is some really great advice. And, and Dorota, you provided some, some nice guiding questions for folks. Um, so this is actually a really nice segue to um, a topic that I, I think is really important to bring up, which is a, a lawsuit that was going on in Philadelphia starting back in, in, it looks like March, 2018. So just to give listeners a little background. Um, so in, in March, 2018, the city of Philadelphia learned that two agencies it hired to provide foster care services to children would not do so based on their religious ob obligation, except um, same sex, sex couple to, excuse me, would not based on their religious, religious obligation, accept same sex couples as foster parents. So they would not accept same sex couples to foster. So just knowing from what you said before to knowing what was going on in Philadelphia, can you discuss your initial thoughts around this topic? Um, because I think it's really controversial. Yes, it is. And, you know, it involves, some complex um, areas of constitutional law, free exercise, free speech, non-discrimination and foster care laws, right? So you put all of that together and it becomes a very complicated discussion with respect to the law. But I just wanted to, to read to you, you know, what one of these areas um, is really referencing and why this is so impactful in terms of a case. But whether a government violates the First Amendment by conditioning a religious agency's ability to participate in the foster care system on taking actions and making statements that directly contradict the agency's religious beliefs. So what that all means in very complicated uh, language, because you know we in the legal system, we can't make anything easy, right? But Essentially, what that's saying is, you know, can we make a religious institution do what we want it to do within the foster care system if it is doing something that we feel is discrimination against a particular sector of our community, right? And that's a hard, that, that's a hard pill to swallow. It's, you know, the separation of church and state and all of the, um, the areas that fall in line with that. But bottom line, and we don't know where this is going to lead. You know, um, I think, like you said, it's very controversial. There's a lot of complex issues. I'm not necessarily sure that they'll even rule on these complex issues. Um, and even if this wasn't um, a successful uh, litigation um, by, by Philadelphia, um, and it may not necessarily be viewed uh, in the LGBTQ community as a positive step in the right direction, I'm here to tell you that there are still dozens of agencies out there that do not have these restrictions. Like we talked about, do your research. There's so many agencies um, within our state and outside our state that is inclusive and it is a better fit in that respect. Um, so those are the agencies that we will be working with and they want families. And there's so many children out there, especially you know LGBTQ youth out there. I see so many cases now, even working with Bradbury, of youth that are homeless um, for reasons of you know not being accepted through their families and needing homes in many instances, and you know because a lot of times um, they don't come out until later on in life, you know when they're older, um, you know in their teens or you know, in high school. And then if their families are not accepting of that situation, what do they do? Um, and how can we help them? And how can our families also help in those instances by being open to older youth um, and children that really need homes in instances of an LGBTQ situation, right? Um, and, and allowing that acceptance and that inclusivity also in those situations for our older youth. I see so many of those cases now and there are families out there that are willing to help. And these are those perfect situations where, you know, our families and our, in this community can assist in that way as well. I, I would agree with what you just said. You know, I, when I talk to people or I'm out, I, I'm always saying the same thing. Like if you're thinking about becoming a foster parent, just make the leap and do it. And certainly, I'm going to tell you, I want you to call my agency. You know what I mean? I think we're the best around for lots of reasons, but I just want you to call somebody, 
I want you to call an agency and I want you to find a place that you're comfortable because there's kids out there that need you. And, and that's part of the appeal really today is about, you know, we're looking at you. We're, please pick up the phone and make a call to some agencies or do some research and, and find a place where you're comfortable. And I think the other piece to this is if you don't feel like in your life, you can be a foster parent, be an advocate advocate for these kids, you know, talk to other people who you think might be great foster or adoptive parents and advocate for our kids in Pennsylvania to find the families that they need to be successful. We know that when kids have a permanent connection, so permanent connection may not even mean adoption, but it just means that there's a permanent connection and support system that a child has, they will be a successful adult. So how can you play a part in that? And what role can you play in that? And so if you can't be a foster parent and you're like, this isn't for me, what can you do? And, and so that's kind of the appeal we ask for all the time. And just to tie things up about the lawsuit going on in Philadelphia, it looks like, um, so Philadelphia informed those agencies that weren't um, accepting same-sex couples that they will no longer refer children to them unless they agreed to comply with non-discrimination requirements that are part of all foster care agency contracts. Um, and one of the agencies agreed to do so and the other has sued the city. So this is still ongoing, unfortunately. Um, and I'm sure it's not the only scenario like this, unfortunately. Um, it's not the only city probably dealing with something like this. So it's important to, to keep talking about. Um, so, so moving on, um, one of the next questions I have is around the Family First Prevention Services Act um, and the impact that's had. So just, just for listeners, I'll give a brief explanation. Uh, this particular bill aims to prevent children from entering foster care by allowing federal reimbursement for mental health services, substance use treatment, and in-home parenting skill training. It also seeks to improve the well-being of children already in foster care by incentivizing states to reduce placement of children in congregate care. So um, I would love to hear from both of you whether you feel like the impact of this bill has been positive or negative or a little bit of both. Yeah, I and definitely think that um, it, it's, it could be viewed as a positive and negative. Um, positive because you know there's been long overdue a need for historic reform um, in this particular area and you know it it really is a matter of keeping children safe right um, so the shift now is to go away from congreg congregate re residential situations for children to um, preventative care to keep children within their homes um, and potentially use kin as well. And Deb can talk to you a little bit about what that looks like in the foster system and using kin, because that's also a broad area um, of individuals that, that they're looking at to essentially keep children within the family um, and maintain that kind of stability and security within the family. So the, the positive is that all of these reforms are happening at a time when it's needed um, it's long overdue and it's in so many different areas that um, promote the, the foster system and, and adoptions in general um, and keeping children safe, right? The, the negative that it could or could be used uh, or viewed as a negative component of it is that it's reducing the amount of children um, available because they are not in those situations where uh, they were before um, due to preventative care and kin, you know, kin placements. Yeah, I, I think it certainly strengthens the kinship um, perspective. Pennsylvania, I think, has been a little ahead of the game there with looking at kin for a very long time. Um, but it also, again, goes to, it takes a village for a child and a family. And so, you know, for a very long time, we looked at the family and the parents and the child as, as we were looking at whether they should stay in the home or not. And so this allows for monies to kind of help prevent that from happening and for children to have to come into placement. And we know that there's trauma. We know that there's trauma when they're in a home that's experiencing dysfunction, but we know there's more trauma when you take a child away from that and away from the, their comforts. Um, 
And so, you know, trying to prevent that and have money available to help families be successful so that doesn't happen. I think what what will happen and what we've seen over time, especially as we've strengthened our in-home services in Pennsylvania, is that the kids who do come into placement then have many more significant challenges and issues because of the types of dysfunctions that they're coming from, because of the length of time that they've stayed in those environments. <clears throat> and so it makes our job um, on the placement side a little more difficult in terms of making sure that we have the resources available to help those children when they come into placement. Um, so, you know, what's happened is a lot of times those kids struggle when they're in foster homes, when they're in a community setting, when they're in a public school setting. And so we need to make sure that there's enough resources available for those kids who do come into placement um, to help them. So that means, you know, uh, different kinds of school settings that we might ha have to have children referred to, making sure we have enough mental health services available to help kids maintain a, maintain a home-like setting. Uh, many kids, because there's a lack of foster parents, end up in a group home setting. You know, so again, it goes to part of our conversation today, which is about celebrating foster parents, helping people understand how they can become a foster parent and how they can walk alongside of an agency and have an agency support them in that because kids are more successful when they're in a family. But that doesn't mean that there's not gonna be challenges. Um, you know, all children are different. I talk about this. Um, I've not been a foster parent myself, but I've raised three kids. All, my three kids are all different. They all presented different challenges, some medical, some behavioral. You know what I mean? I didn't have experience parenting, but I had a village. You know, I had support systems that helped me. And so for foster parents to have children come into their home, you know, agencies provide that other extra layer of support besides their own support network to help them with that. And so, you know, we do want to look to find families who are available to take these kids who would traditionally be in a group home. Um, and that tends to be older teens, um, LGBTQ teens who, you know, aren't feeling it in families because for whatever reason, they may, you know, they're not feeling the support that they need. Um, we, we need to find families who are going to be available to these kids because as Pennsylvania moves forward with uh, the implementation of Family First, um, these kids are going to be moving out of group home settings. And um, so, you know, we're here and there's many other agencies in the community that are here to help support families to be able to provide foster care for these kids. And I just wanted to add, you know, what, what it's supposed to support also, which, which is a huge component of what we're, what we're seeing um, in like the family law court system is, you know, the opioid, you know, issues and, um, and how that impacts families now, you know, there, there was this huge shift to, of so many children in foster care as a result of, you know, families in crisis like this, um, that weren't getting the help needed to, you know, maintain that household, maintain that family, um, get the, the type of guidance necessarily to, to help uh, with drug issues in the household. This act is supposed to assist in that as well, remedy that situation. I mean, I, I have many counties in crisis right now in my family law practice that we're, you know, we're dealing with these types of issues in custody cases um, and throughout. And I'm sure the foster system is still experiencing those issues and and the resulting impact is more children in foster care, right? So this is also supposed to um, provide funds for more preventative care and care for children to provide safe environments for children in those um, families in crisis, right? So I just wanted to mention that because this does have a direct target for that. Um, and the act is, you know, is there to benefit the families in those situations, which is really important right now. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to say, I mean, this is really important and I'm glad the state of Pennsylvania is looking to this as, a, as, as one of the priorities and um, providing, um, you know, extra support around this because I think there's there could be a huge benefit for it. Um, so that's great. So uh, we're almost at the end. Uh, I wanted to kind of open it up to both of you for anything else specific that you wanted to share, whether that it's, it, it's about your practice um, that you do or uh, anything you wanted to share with the group. Yes, if I may. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> 
if I may, yeah, just wanted to mention that, you know, a, a good portion of my practice also is step parent and second parent adoptions. Um, you know, after marriage equality, you know, there was a, a, a really good shift for use of assisted reproduction um, technology and the laws associated with that kind of came um, hand, hand in hand with respect to that. And so I see a lot of um, second parent and, and step parent adoptions because of that. Um, unfortunately, the law still hasn't caught up necessarily to the, the, the changes with marriage equality. And because other states um, and other countries still view uh, marriage equality differently and parentage differently, um, especially for the non-biologically uh, you know, related parent, it's so important to still proceed with the adoption process to have full security with respect to parent um, parentage and um, custody rights with respect to your children. So we still do a lot of that. Um, we're happy to do it because that gives us the assurance that um, parents have you know, full faith and credit wherever they go uh, with respect to having you know, full rights to their children, regardless of whether they're genetically related or not. So that is a huge portion of what we do and I'm happy to provide that service um, until such time as the laws change and we don't have to do it anymore. Um, because as you know, because of marriage equality, um, a lot of times birth certificates aren't an issue anymore in the, you know, in the, in the days that we had to also change birth certificates and assure um, that kind of recognition as well. Um, that has passed now, but that's just an administrative order. So that adoption decree gives you that, you know, that perfect security that we all are looking for in those situations. So I just wanted to mention that that is still a good portion of our practice and um, an important part of you know, maintaining rights for your children. Yeah, and I I know that um, Pennsylvania went to allowing unmarried people to adopt, and that was a while ago. I and mean, we had foster parents, again, I've done this for a long time, who were unmarried couples, and they had children in their home, and they wanted to adopt. And the judge was saying, well, you can't because you're not married, or only one of you can. And we just kind of went, what? You know, and so I, you know, I know that there's been a lot of laws that have changed around that. Um, so that's really good that you continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I think from the perspective from, you know, the children's home, I, I'd like to just, you know, mention, we are looking for any families who can provide um, some flexibility, some, you know, people who can have a sense of humor, have an ability to learn, um, have a commitment to get support or ask for support if needed. Um, and if you just feel like you you have more to give um, and and can learn, you know, we're doing all of our sessions virtually. So this has caused a lot of changes for a lot of what we do, but I think it's been nicer uh, for a lot of our families. You know, our, we like families who are busy because they're really good families. They're involved in their community and that's great things for kids, but they've struggled to find time to do the amount of training that you need to and get your paperwork done. And so, by moving to a virtual world, we've had a lot of families um, trained and approved with us during that process and they've loved it. Our um, concern at the time was we believe that they support each other and how were people gonna feel support in a virtual world? And I watched our trainings and I was so happy to see people entering and it was like they were walking into the room and they were like, hi, oh, I'm so glad you're here tonight. I mean, it was just a good feel. So we moved all of our training, we're all virtual. And I think we'll probably continue to be virtual with a small portion of in-person um, contact with our families as we move forward out of the COVID-19 world. So I think a positive positive that's come out of that for us. Um, but, you know, we are here to also celebrate our foster parents and anybody who's a foster parent. And we're going to do that in May um, with the fight and fills. We're having a, a movie night and it's about becoming a superhero, you know, be a superhero to a child. We believe our kids are superheroes, you know, and so we're having a movie night on May 22nd and it's free to the public, but you do need to register. 
you can go to our website to register for that. And that's um, Building Kids Lives. You can go to our website to find out more information about being a foster parent. Um, but, you know, come out on May 22nd to the Fight and Fills in, in Berks County and celebrate foster parents and see a free movie and have fun with your family. So. That's wonderful. We'll definitely include more information on that movie night so folks uh, know exactly how, how to attend. Um, so I want to thank Kingsbury Law Firm and the Children's Home of Reading for sponsoring this event and joining and for Dorota and Deb for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, Dorota and Deb both have specific FAQs that I'm going to share right now uh, around adoption that might be helpful for any listeners on the call. Um, so you can take a look at those. And lastly, if you would like to learn more about both organizations, you can follow the link that will be on the last slide. Thank you so much and have a great day.